All right. Missing two, but hopefully they'll get here soon. So um, we're going to talk about aerobic and anaerobic exercise today, with a little heavier focus on the aerobic part. Um, and lab today, we've got some activities for the first half and then for the second lab. Um, on the schedule, it's actually kind of the review lab, which when I put the syllabus together, I should have put that before we had the practicals, but I didn't. So we're not going to do the review lab. We're going to do just another activity to kind of help you wrap your heads around understanding how to apply some of these concepts to, um, to your patients and different patient populations. So that's kind of the game plan for this class for this week. Um, so let's get rolling here. I know I just let somebody in. Need to see who that was before I start. It's Ellie. There we go. All right. So aerobic or endurance activity um, has a lot of different components to it, and it's definitely been shown time and time again to be the most effective type of exercise for reducing your risk of all kinds of chronic diseases um, that cost our healthcare system billions upon billions of dollars when we look at risks for heart disease, for diabetes, things associated with obesity, um, even, even things like cancers, um, pretty much compared to flexibility, compared to range of motion, compared to um, endurance or compared to strength exercise, um, aerobic activity is pretty much the king when it comes to disease prevention. So it should be something that we're all doing um, to some level or another. You don't have to be extreme like me to get those benefits. Um, we'll talk about what the standards recommend um, for, for that level of activity as well as we go. That's not actually my picture. It looks kind of like it could be. All right, so um, different types of endurance. We've talked earlier in the semester about muscle endurance versus cardiovascular endurance or aerobic endurance. Um, sometimes those last two terms use somewhat interchangeably. Um, and, and they definitely have different components. And certainly because if somebody is well-trained in the area of muscular endurance, their ability to hold a plank forever, their ability to do, you know, 100 push-ups in two minutes, their ability to do lots of crunches in a short period of time, um, that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to have great aerobic endurance. Um, if you have good muscular endurance, you're more likely to have good muscular strength. And certainly there's a stronger association that people that have high levels of muscular strength, the ability to generate lots of force um, at max, do have improved muscular endurance. Um, but again, that doesn't necessarily carry over to aerobic endurance. Um, we, we do need all the different types of um, components of physical fitness to be you know, truly well-rounded as far as our fitness levels and our health is concerned. But again, statistically, when it comes to disease prevention, the cardiovascular aerobic endurance by far has the strongest correlation with helping those things in the long term. Um, so we want to talk about kind of how you get people in better shape um, as far as their endurance is concerned, um, what kind of things we would be progressing. Um, we'll talk about what sorts of activities would qualify as aerobic endurance or aerobic exercise as well. Um, and then from a clinical standpoint, we need to know if we're having people engage in prolonged physical activity, what are the signs and symptoms that we really need to be watching out for? Um, it's one thing to um, have a healthy person that you're trying to have improve their aerobic endurance to be able to perform in a given athletic event, whether it's a 5K, whether it's a triathlon or, or whatever you're looking at. Um, and, and we're going to train those people at a much different, in a much different way than we'll train somebody that's coming off of, say, a heart attack or a stroke that we're trying to improve their aerobic conditioning, not only to help them get back to be able to tolerate doing their ADLs throughout the course of the day, um, but also just in helping them um, decrease the risk that they're going to have another episode, another heart attack, another stroke, another complication resulting to from being deconditioned. And, and we can improve, you know, pretty much all of our aspects of conditioning, whether we're talking about flexibility, strength, aerobic endurance throughout our lifetime. Um, 
but when we get older or when we have a, a history of um, comorbidities, prior conditions, then we have to be cautious about how we do that. We need to really be watching out for um, signs of distress and, and understand when we need to have the person stop, um, start monitoring their, their vitals and things like that, um, when we need to potentially call for extra help if we are having a, a bigger complication occur. So we'll, we'll go through all that stuff as well. All right, so just some definitions. Um, aerobic capacity, maximum ability to generate ATP versus, or via, excuse me, cellular processes that require oxygen. Um, so what types of, if we, if we have somebody train and let's say they were sedentary and we have them do, you know, start doing a, a walking program that turns into a kind of a walk run program. I'm not gonna say the J word, Cami. Um, and um, we're able to improve them. We work with them for two, three months. Um, what sort of changes are gonna take place in their body that would help them improve their aerobic capacity from a physiological standpoint? What are some of the things that happen with consistent aerobic training? Increased mitochondria. Okay, so we're gonna definitely, the, the muscles that we're using on a regular basis will have a stimulus that says, hey, we need to be able to make more ATP. And the best way for us to do that is by using oxygen so that we can maximize how many ATP we can make from every gram of fat or every gram of carbohydrate. Um, and so making more mitochondria definitely will play a big role in that because we increase that ability to use oxygen to help generate ATP. So what else would happen? Increased vascularization. Okay, so a lot more capillaries go into that area so that we have to support the delivery of oxygen to all those mitochondria that we're adding. So those two things pretty much go hand in hand. Um, if we can increase the number of capillaries in a given amount of muscle, then we decrease that diffusion distance for the oxygen to travel to deliver oxygen to the cells, but also for the waste products that are being produced to get out of the cell so that we can also help to maintain pH. So again, almost all of these processes that occur, these changes are being driven because of negative feedback loops. Um, it's not that the body proactively wants to be able to use oxygen better that we grow more capillaries. It's really so we can get rid of the waste um, so that we can restore homeostasis to the tissues better. And that's the same stimulus really that makes us generate more mitochondria if we're producing a lot of waste, then the body's like, hey, what are some ways we can decrease the, the rate that we're producing all this waste? And increasing mitochondria will, again, help us to restore homeostasis faster. Um, it, it'll prevent it from occurring as quickly in the first place, or it won't occur until we push things to a higher um, level of intensity, potentially. So again, all those things are, are very much reactive changes to the waste producing things that are going on in the body when we train on a regular basis. So what else? We got capillaries, we got mitochondria. So that's kind of at the tissue level. Um, what, what else might happen in the tissues? Besides just having the mitochondria, what other changes would we need to see if we're trying to improve the ability to generate ATP using oxygen? I might be wrong. Um, would it be an increase of potassium? Um, I don't know that we'll necessarily increase potassium a ton. I mean, it's, it's quite possible that we might have more of kind of all of their different ions that we need because we're just creating more flux by training on a regular basis, whether it's calcium or potassium or sodiums. Um, we definitely are having a lot of ion movement with all the muscle contraction going on and the, the ability or the need to sustain muscle contraction, but I'm not sure that it would be um, easily measurable. It's not one of the things that I generally have seen cited as distinct changes that we see. Um, maybe burning fat, like using the fat instead of um, the, what is it called? The... I don't know, like just using the fat more. Okay, instead of using glucose, that one, that thing. 
that other that other energy substrate. Um, so yeah, we're, we're, I mean, having more mitochondria makes it so we can use oxygen better. Um, the other thing that I was getting to with kind of the tissue level changes would be things that would support oxidizing fat. And, and that's going to be a lot of the different enzyme concentrations of the things that help cleave the fat molecules apart, of the things that help to um, contribute to the enzyme steps in the Krebs cycle, the different components that facilitate the electron transport chain. We have all sorts of intermediary molecules that kind of step in in those different processes. And we need more of those to handle that extra uh, or to help create that extra um, oxygen utilization um, kind of all along the way. So a lot of different enzymatic changes will take place also. Yeah, Alex. So what's the mechanism that leads the um, muscles to store more glucose or even more fat to draw from? Okay, so we will see um, typically an increase in glycogen storage. Um, we don't tend to necessarily store more fat intramuscularly. Um, there probably might be a little bit about that, but we definitely have a much greater capacity to store more glycogen so that when the muscles are using it at a high rate, we have more available. And that, that helps not only prolong the amount of time that you can go in an endurance event, but it's also going to help with any type of anaerobic activity because if we've got glucose stores available, then we can do that high intensity exercise more reps. So you could get in that extra set or you could extend from doing 10 reps to doing 15 reps um, before you start depleting those and being able to do, you know, multiple sets of all the different strength exercises before you start running out of, out of um, glycogen stores. So glycogen storage can definitely help both aerobic and anaerobic capacity. If we've just got more fuel in the tank, we can go for longer with either type of activity. What else? How about, um, so th those are a lot of the things that would go on in the tissues themselves. What are some other bigger kind of systemic changes that we would expect to see with aerobic conditioning? Did you have an increase in bone density? Depending on what type of activity you're doing. So if you were doing swimming, not so much. If you're doing cycling, not so much. If you're doing walking or running, or step aerobics, then more so because you're just having bigger impact forces being carried through the body. And so that would definitely help um, stimulate some bone mass development. It would increase your percentage of VO2 max, like how much of your VO2 max you can use, I guess. I don't know how to say that, but. Okay, so that's kind of more related to like lactate threshold. Um, and that is a change that will take place. And, and that's kind of a multifactorial change. It has some things to do with what's going on at the tissue level that we've already talked about, as far as the ability to burn, to use oxygen to generate ATP um, related to those diffusion distances, those enzyme concentrations, things like that. Um, but the other big factor that's going to help is kind of the other big systemic things. What's, what's kind of the key driver for improvements in aerobic capacity. Your lung function and heart function. So more so the latter than the, than the former. So the, the cardiac function is going to be the most adaptable. Um, certainly we can improve our breathing mechanics a little bit, um, but our lungs themselves don't really change shape. Um, they don't hypertrophy like muscle does. They don't hypertrophy like the heart does. Um, the muscles that move our rib cage, our diaphragm, our intercostals and things like that, they'll improve their conditioning. And so they'll be able to go longer um, with consistent training because we're challenging in the, them that way. And that specificity principle is gonna apply to those muscles, but we don't change the, you know, our rib cage diameter doesn't change, our height doesn't change. And those are really the big things that determine how big your lungs are. But the heart, um, we're gonna see a, increased capillarization in the heart, just like we would the skeletal muscle. And so now that heart can continue to pump and stay in a situation where it can use oxygen to generate ATP, and you're less likely to cause the heart to start to fatigue and produce too much metabolic waste, like we would see when you're feeling the burn um, in skeletal muscle. 
And so those things would also tend to improve um, endurance. So the heart's going to have better capillarization. It's going to have a better ability to fuel itself. Um, but its pumping efficiency is going to improve a lot too because we're challenging it to pump a large amount of blood three times a week for 30 minutes at a time or whatever the case might be. Um, and, and so that's going to have a big, big effect. And then we also are going to see really rapid changes in blood volume. Um, and those, that's the most transient thing, the thing that can come and go the easiest. Um, when we talk about people going on bed rest, they're aerobic endurance decreases really quickly. And it's not that they've lost the mitochondria and the capillaries in the muscle. It's not that the heart has lost blood vessels. It's mostly that we lose blood volume really quickly. The body very rapidly realizes, this, hey, why do I need all this extra plasma? I'm laying here in bed doing nothing. Um, I'm not having to fight gravity. I'm not having to do much anything. Um, so we'll pee it out. Our kidneys will just say, hey, why do we need all this extra fluid? We don't. But when we do start training on a regular basis, the body also figures it out really quickly, you know, delivering all this blood to the tissues would be a lot easier if I had a bigger blood volume. And so we will increase red blood cell counts so we can carry more oxygen, but that takes some time. It takes a while to get the bone marrow to ramp up its production of, of red blood cells, but our kidneys very quickly can say, hey, well, I can add more liquid. That's easy. I just you know, won't excrete as much. And so if we can increase our blood volume substantially, it makes our blood thinner. So it's not as dense and viscous. So it's easier for the heart to pump and it's easier to maintain a high level of perfusion throughout all the tissues. So those, those hemodynamic changes, the ability of the heart to pump more effectively and pump for longer without fatiguing. And the fact that we can change those blood volumes really quickly will also be big things that, that improve our ability to go for a longer period of time um, when we look at aerobic training. So what about anaerobic capacity? If we, let's say we have somebody that does a lot of resistance training on a regular basis, or they do a lot of sprint work um, on a regular basis, those would both be examples of anaerobic type of activities. What sort of um, changes would occur that would help us make more ATP without using oxygen? have more of the uh, fast twitch uh, fibers, right? The muscle fibers, like- So we won't, most research doesn't really support that we will change that. We kind of have what we got from our parents is what most people think. There might be a slight ability to change those numbers a little bit, but it's really still kind of not well established that that happens. Um, so it's not, so that probably wouldn't necessarily change a whole lot. Um, it would give that person a better ability to do those activities if you have a higher percentage, but it's not something that we really have well established that that is a true change that we see with training. I know that we don't see the same mitochondria or um, capillarization differences in yeah, so we won't. anaerobic training, but somehow there's an ability to process lactic acid faster. So what's the mechanism behind that? Yeah, we do, we do see some of those changes so that we can get rid of waste quicker. Um, one thing that we can do is we'll improve our buffering capability. So if you remember the bicarbonate buffer system that helps us to kind of blunt the rise in, or the drop in pH that we see when the acid level climbs. Um, and again, the kidneys play a big role in that because the kidneys kind of decide how much bicarbonate ion to hold on to and how much to let escape from the body. And so that's another thing that we can change fairly rapidly um, through the kidney level. And then there's a number of hormonal steps that would probably direct some of those changes too. So that buffering capability is different. Um, what else might you think would happen with anaerobic training sort of changes? Well, we have eventually, first the neuromuscular um, adaptations. Okay. That so occur sure those would, strength. Yeah, those would definitely help improve performance really quickly. Um, it, as far as helping us understand, helping us intuitively kind of 
figure out how to recruit the muscles more effectively and in the right sequence. Um, that, that definitely can play a role in our, probably more in our maximal abilities um, than necessarily like anaerobic endurance, our ability to kind of do multiple sets of, of high intensity work. Um, but our certainly our max capability is greatly enhanced if we can recruit stuff a lot more effectively from a neuromuscular standpoint. Um, so if we, if we think about when we talk about aerobic changes, um, I mentioned all the different enzymatic changes that can occur to help support oxidative metabolism, um, the ability to burn fats and carbohydrates with oxygen. We're going to see those same kind of enzymatic changes for the other systems when we do a lot of anaerobic conditioning. So we'll improve our creatine phosphate system capacity so that we can really get that immediate availability of ATP. We're gonna improve our ability to do anaerobic glycolysis, those things that occur before the Krebs cycle where we do end up producing either lactate or pyruvate. Um, and again, that ability to buffer that um, lactate is what helps us kind of reestablish homeostasis and keep those anaerobic processes going. Because once that pH gets too low, then most of the enzymes quit working and the whole process starts to slow down pretty significantly. So we do see some pretty big differences um, in what happens in the body to support those two different distinct types of exercise, aerobic versus anaerobic. Um, so how do we assess those things? How do we tell how fit somebody is from an aerobic capacity standpoint or from an anaerobic capacity standpoint? Well, from the aerobic standpoint, you're going to see changes in heart rate. You're going to see changes in um, the, the effort they put out. You would measure against um, you know, how much, if you're on a treadmill or running, how much ground you cover in the same amount of time, you're going to see the elapsed time for the set distance decrease. Um, okay. You're going to see heart rate decrease. Okay. So we've got, so things like if we're looking at a set distance um, and there's a number of what we call field tests that do that. And if you think about, if you know anything about the military, they have their standards that the people have to run their two mile distance in um, based on their gender um, and probably their age too, hopefully. Um, that they need to cover it in this certain amount of time to pass their so-called PT tests. Um, and that's not physical, that's physical training tests, not physical therapy tests. Um, and so we do have those that have been developed, the one and a half mile run walk or two mile run walk, lots of um, different standards that have come up for that. And so yeah, the, the person that has a higher level of aerobic fitness will go further in that, it will take less time to cover that distance or they'll go further if you do a time test, how far can you go in 12 minutes, for example, then that's a, the kind of the opposite dynamic of that. And so the more fit you are, the farther you could co go in that short amount of time. So that's that's one way or a couple of ways, those, those field test type ways. What else? Would like measuring endurance levels also be a part of that? Um, well, for sure. How, what way, how are you thinking about measuring them? Uh, possibly by doing sprints or long runs and just seeing how the body reacts to each of them. I guess that's how I would, <laughs> I would right. do it long distance compared to sprinting. Yeah. And so, I mean, Tom had mentioned some of those things with heart rate and stuff like that. And so if we look at what sort of heart rate change did somebody have to a given workload, um, or what sort of how close to max were you able to push that person? So we have, you know, kind of the gold standard is the, the VO2 max test. And you can do that um, with a number of different devices. Most of those field tests that I talk about, the 12 minute run, the two mile run, those kind of things are um, ways to estimate VO2 max without actually having to measure the gas, but still get some idea of that person's change in their, in their fitness level. Um, and so that's, that's kind of the most common one, but you can also do a standard workload and see how the person responds to that workload. And so we'll have you guys next semester, when we go over the cardiopulmonary section in um, procedures two, we'll have you do step tests on each other. And so a step test is an example of a test where we, everybody does the same amount of work, 
and we see how much that workload made your heart rate go up. And that's a measure of how well your body is able to handle that challenge. If you're really, really fit, your heart rate won't climb that much because it's not that hard of a challenge. But if you're out of shape, then your heart rate's gonna skyrocket when we do that step test. In a step test, you're stepping a certain height at a certain rate. So it's basically the same amount of work for each person um, when we do that. So those are kind of some ideas about how we can measure aerobic. And I will say aerobics easier to measure because it lasts longer. You have more time to gather data and collect heart rate and look at respiratory rates and things like that. Anaerobic tests are harder to capture a lot of those physiological changes with because they happen so quickly. And when the person feels like they need to stop, then you often see like in the bloodstream kind of a delayed response where the ch blood pH changes, the changes in lactate concentration will shoot up after the person finishes because essentially you've just finished creating all this waste at the tissue level and it takes a little bit of time for all that to get back into the systemic circulation and show up if you're drawing blood out of the wrist. Let's say we were doing leg exercises, that blood that was leaving the legs that has all that metabolic waste has to travel up the inferior vena cava to the heart, get pumped out into the systemic circulation, find it back down to the periphery of the arm before we sample that blood. And so it kind of dilutes a little bit, but it also creates kind of a delayed effect. And so it is really hard to capture things anaerobically, but we do have some different tests. Um, I'll show you a video of one test called the Wingate test. That's probably the, one of the more common ones for looking at anaerobic um, capacity. Let's do that now and then I'll come back to these last few. All right, so here's a little clip of a VO2 test in case you haven't seen one before. Uh, hi, I'm Imo. Hi, I'm Steve Mitzel. I'm a 1500 metre runner and I also do cross country. And my main distance is 1500 metres. So we're going to set Steve up here on the, on the VO2 max test. This piece of equipment and this actual test is used at the top end of sport and will produce some really, really interesting results. Okay, if you can take your shirt off for me, so I need to put some of these ECG electrodes on. So we're going to put 10 of these on. This will allow us to monitor your heart rate whilst you're exercising and um, let us look at the rhythm that it's producing during the test. So the heart beats due to electrical activity that's created to cause it to contract and therefore pump the blood around the body. So during the test we would expect Steve's heart rate to increase as his heart has to work harder to pump more blood around to his working muscles. So in a minute we're going to pop the mask on Okay, I'm going to put up a blood pressure cuff on you and an oximeter probe so we can look at your oxygen levels. Okay. I'm going to pop you up on the treadmill. We're going to get three minutes of resting data. Okay. All right. Yeah. And then every three minutes, the gradient is going to increase on the treadmill. Okay. okay? And the speed will increase as well. Cool. Basically, you need to keep going for as long as you possibly can. Less than 30 seconds to go at this level. Keep it going, doing really, really well. Next level is going to get a little bit steeper again and the speed will go up. Keep that going. Okay, so her heart rate is currently 150 beats per minute, which is 75% uh, of her age predicted max. So he's got a heart rate of 154 beats per minute and his predicted value is 199. And he's breathing in and out 90 litres of air per minute at the moment. Every time we make the treadmill steeper and faster, her heart rate goes up to compensate for that. And the amount of oxygen she has to pump around her body also increases. Okay, so your heart rate's up to 166 beats per minute now, so that's really good. And now you're breathing in now 113 litres per minute of air. That's excellent, well done. So just keep that going for me. I'm going to start working you really hard now, so you need to keep it going. Come on, you're doing a great job. Can you keep going just a little bit more? Go on, really push it out. Come on, keep it going. Well done, really good. Okay, so we can hear his breathing's getting faster now. You can hear him having to work harder to get that air in and out of his lungs. Okay, come on, keep it going then, all right? 
really good. That's cool. Yeah, alright. Okay, hold on there. Well done. We can hear him breathing really hard to get the air in and out. He was shifting about 123 litres per minute there. You can hear him breathing really hard in and out. You feeling alright? Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, that was good. That's pretty tough. But yeah, it gets really tough really quickly at the end. So it'd be interesting to see what my heart rate's like, what my VA2, my breathing rate's like. I've never done anything like this before. Yeah, looking forward to getting the results. All right, so that's kind of a taste of a VO2 test. And um, the woman that was performing the test on them, if you notice, she was really trying to give them a lot of encouragement, especially in those later stages, because mentally it's really hard. They're going up a big, huge hill. And we have to use that kind of hill when you do a walking or a running VO2 test because that helps us use a lot more quads than we would on level ground. It helps us use a lot more glutes than we would on level ground. And the more muscle mass you can use, the higher VO2 values you can potentially get. Um, and, and so for most people, uphill running is going to be the easiest way to get that large amount of muscle mass recruited to get the highest true peak um, VO2 max value. Um, if you have a really well-trained cyclist, they're good at doing that pedaling pattern and, and they are able to get really pretty close to those um, running values. But for most people that are not trained cyclists, their cycling VO2 values will be much less because they're just not using their hamstrings as much as you would. It's a very quad dominant. And for most people that aren't skilled cyclists, they tend to just push down on the pedals and they don't understand how to apply force throughout the whole pedal stroke. Um, and so that makes it hard for those people, especially if they're not well trained to get those peak values. Um, the highest values that you usually see are actually with cross country ski um, VO2 max test because then unlike the uphill running test, we're getting a big upper body muscle component too. And so that's usually where we see the highest values. All right, so here's a Wingate test. Um, and so this is an anaerobic cycling test. And this first one, they kind of talk about it. Um, the second one is actually the University of Wisconsin hockey team cheering each other on with it. Um, I think I may just show that hockey one because it's um, a little more intense. Um, I'll, I'll tell you what the test is like. You, you're on a what's called an ergometer, so it's not like a normal like bike that you see at, at Foss or something like that. It's designed so you can load a sp specific amount of um, weight that the person has to overcome when they're pedaling. Um, and, and with the Wingate test, they base it on how big the person is. Um, the more muscle mass you have, the easier it is to push those pedals down. And so that by scaling this test to that person's weight, it, it evens the playing field a little bit more. Um, but essentially the person's gonna get going pedaling as kind of as fast as they can. And then they drop the weight on them and they try and keep pedaling as hard as they possibly can um, for a full 30 seconds. Um, and you really can't maintain that pace for 30 seconds. And so they basically start seizing up as the, the pH levels in the muscle tissue starts to drop and the enzymes quit working and muscle contraction starts to fail. And so their repetitions will slow uh, or the revolution rate will slow dramatically as they start to fatigue. Um, it's even harder mentally to keep going on this test than it is for the VO2 test. Um, it's a little bit easier in the sense that the finish line is much closer in sight because the whole test is only 30 seconds to begin with. So any, it's a lot easier to keep pushing yourself when you know you've only got five or 10 seconds left than when you've got a whole other two minutes left in the stage or something like that. Uh, today we're performing the uh, Wingate uh, bike test. Basically what that does is it tests the player's uh, anaerobic peak power and their anaerobic capacity. Their peak RPMs, which on average for guys is anywhere from 200 to 220 RPMs. Once they reach that peak RPM, uh, that 10% of their body weight is actually dropped onto the bike and they're able to perform the test for 30 seconds as hard as, hard as they can. Uh, and from that, we can, like I said, we can measure their anaerobic peak power, so how much power they can produce at 
at uh, one time and also their anaerobic capacity, meaning how much power they can produce over that 30 second time window, uh, which is similar to what happens in, in, in ice hockey. So a lot of the research correlates high uh, wind gate scores to effective skaters on the ice, which I've seen it, it, as well. It was good. I mean, it's nice now to be done with it. But, um, you know, it's tough. I mean, you get spinning so fast in the beginning, and then uh, once they drop that weight on you, just try and battle through it. But, you know, you're a little woozy when you get off, but a couple minutes later, you feel all right now. We've been here all summer working out, getting stronger and stuff like that. So, you know, just as you get older and stronger, you definitely, uh, your scores get better. So, yeah, I mean, it's fun. You know, guys can pick out what song they want to uh, listen to while they're on the bike. All right, that's not my song, so I had to end it. No, actually, I have more to talk about before I had to end it. So both are pretty intense tests. I will say on that VO2 max test, the first one they walked, watched, um, when they ended the test, I don't know if it was for the video's sake, but they had the person, they just shot the treadmill and the person stopped moving, which is a big no-no because you've got so much vasodilation going to your legs from having been working so hard, and then you're gonna have the person stand still. That's a recipe for all that blood to, that's basically stopping the muscle pump action. And so the blood's gonna stay down in your legs and it's very easy for that person to get lightheaded or pass out. So you always wanna keep the person moving. Um, even if they are really fatigued, you slow the belt down really quickly, but have them keep on moving as they go. All right, um, so let's talk about these last couple bullet points and then we'll kind of jump into the rest of the slides um, since I'm only on number four and I only have 27, so that's why I'm taking a little time on this. Um, so how do we know if an exercise is more aerobic or anaerobic? What, what, are, what factors make something aerobic versus anaerobic? I would say it's more time for a, for um, aerobic because you need a longer time to to use that type of um, system because you start in anaerobic for a little bit then you the body will switch over to aerobic once the the system has has been overused for the anaerobic. Okay, so yeah, if we if we jump right into an activity and we haven't really warmed up or anything like that, and all of a sudden I'm running at whatever eight minute miles, my body's kind of in shock and I haven't started to ramp up the aerobic activities yet. The aerobic processing um, steps in the body are not really well primed. And so we will be more anaerobic at the start of that, especially. Now, if you do a kind of more gradual warm up, then when you kind of jump into that aerobic activity, then you are kind of better ready to deal with that. Um, so duration definitely would play a factor in it. Um, things that are anaerobic tend to be much shorter in duration um, than things that are aerobic. What else would be a factor with that? It would factor in the intensity level. Okay, so intensity is definitely going to be an important one too. And, you know, duration and intensity are pretty much going to be inversely related. The harder you go, the shorter amount of time you can keep going that hard. The easier you go, the longer you can tend to sustain that pace. So those two factors definitely are typically inversely related. Um, so intensity. What do, what do we mean if it's saying that it's aerobic? Well, there's, a, there's a range, a heart rate range that you're gonna be operating in that allows you to sustain the effort. Typically when you think, what, personally, when I think of an anaerobic effort, that's a very short high intensity effort that really can't be sustained over a long period of time. If you're, if you're doing an aerobic activity, running or cycling, um, you know, depending on your fitness level, that may be 15, 20 minutes, it may be three or four hours. And you can't maintain an aerobic effort over that long of a period. You just, you know, it's not sustainable. Yeah. Whereas yeah. with an aerobic effort, it's, it's more of a metered approach. Yeah, so we definitely have to pace ourselves a lot more. Um, I used to do triathlons um, back in my 20s and a lot of times they'll call the shorter triathlons a sprint event. And it's like, it's not a sprint. If it's taking you, even if it's taking you 30 minutes, it's not a sprint. A sprint is something that's all out that's taking you more like 30 seconds. Anything beyond about 30 seconds, you really have to start thinking about pacing. 
you know, maybe a minute. I mean, if you look at track and field, 400 meters is kind of the top end of what they consider a sprint. And the, you know, the elite men are doing that in like 43 seconds or so, 44 seconds. The elite women are more like by the high 40s, um, maybe 50 seconds. So those are not long distances. And so again, sprint triathlon, that's a misnomer. It's shorter than other triathlons, but it's definitely not a sprint activity. It's still an aerobic activity. Um, so if it says aerobic, that means we're using, we're generating that ATP by using oxygen. And so we can't generate ATP using oxygen at high intensity. We need the ATP too quickly. And that the way that we derive ATP by using oxygen takes a while. And so it's just physiologically, we can't do that if we're going at a high intensity. Um, so other things that you'll see sometimes included in definitions for aerobic is that it has to use large muscle groups, that it should be reciprocal and rhythmical in nature. So you're doing, you know, right foot, left foot, right foot, left foot, right foot, left foot, right foot, left foot. That's what I mean by rhythmic in nature. Um, you'll see a lot of people talk about um, things like high intensity interval training and CrossFit as being aerobic activities, and they're really not. They're they're, if it's high intensity interval training, that's anaerobic. The high intensity tells you that right in the name. Will it improve some parts of your aerobic capacity? It will, because it's going to help improve your ability to deal with the waste products that you're producing. And if you can deal with this big surge of lactate, then it's going to help you when you're producing less lactate at aerobic levels too. So it's not that those things don't necessarily help your aerobic abilities, but they're not aerobic activities and, and that's, where, something, go ahead. that's where intervals come in yeah and if you're if you're looking at something like crossfit um sometimes they'll have components within their little wad sessions that have aerobic pieces to them where you're gonna you know do the rowing machine for two minutes as hard as you can and then you're gonna jump into some other activity those are most of the the wads are kind of short circuits we have three, four, five, six different exercises that you're repeating in a row, um, but they're not rhythmic in nature. You're doing like a whole bunch of push-ups, then you're jumping in a whole bunch of air squats, then you're jumping in a whole bunch of these wall balls. You're doing all these things that are not rhythmical in nature. So they, it definitely fails to meet a lot of the components that fit into an aerobic definition. Yep. So when I mentioned the lungs, I was thinking about the changes that have to occur, occur for someone who has asthma. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know if those happen on a hormone level or neurotransmitter level. If the lung itself, the tissue doesn't change much, then how does the training, because that's something I notice a change in quickly is uh -huh. my ability to breathe, how my asthma is affected with training. Yeah, and I, I would think it's probably related to just your airways might adapt a little bit to those higher flow rates and not cause as much bronchoconstriction in response to those higher flow rates. If you're more deconditioned or, or, or there's more allergen in the air that are triggering your asthma attacks, things like that, then it makes those airways more reactive. So I think you're probably changing more about that airway reactivity, that chronic inflammatory aspect that can contribute to asthma. And then if we challenge our body on a regular basis with higher rates of breathing, then we're going to make some adaptations to kind of deal with it a little bit more effectively. And then right. a more lower level steady state aerobic activity might not be enough to trigger that full-blown asthma attack. Um, True. Down the road. Yeah. So it's probably helping a lot with, with those aspects. I was curious because we were in our pharmacology class, you know, talking about different medications and the processes that, you know, happen with the uh, bronchodilation and vascular dilation or constriction. And I thought about the training and, and that it must have a similar effect mm -hmm. on the conditioning of, of those. Yeah. Yeah, I would, I would think so. Um, now, this... Second and last bullet point, what would that differ from person to person? So when we look at intensities um, and what makes something aerobic or anaerobic, it's really can you use oxygen to create ATP or are you in a situation where you're having to create ATP without the use of oxygen? 
And so for some people, walking can be an anaerobic event. If they're so deconditioned that as soon as they start exerting themselves, they're starting to produce a lot of metabolic waste because they just don't have the ability to use oxygen very effectively, then I'm not saying like a really slow walk, but, but for some people it might be. If their heart function is really low, if their muscles are really deconditioned, um, if they're, you know, they've had a lung removed for cancer or something like that, even a slow walk might be anaerobic for them. Um, by that same token, somebody that's really, really fit can run pretty hard and it can be very aerobic for them, whereas other people couldn't even run that pace for a minute. So your level of fitness for any given activity will tell you kind of when does it, when does that activity transition from being aerobic in nature to being anaerobic in nature? Um, and it really is, and it's a moving thing. I mean, because we can all improve our fitness level. Um, and so you can change where that split point is between aerobic and anaerobic activity. Um, and so these changes in heart rate and respiratory rate are, again, they are compensations to help reestablish homeostasis. They're not proactive mechanisms to help deliver oxygen. They're reactive mechanisms to help get rid of waste. The side benefit is that they do help deliver oxygen too, but the reason that we see those changes is that the body's trying to reestablish homeostasis. Um, so all these things are driven by increased waste production, really. All hey, right. Craig, I got a question. Yep. So does um, genetics play a role into no matter how much um, anaerobic and aerobic capacity you have? And I, I want to try to be a world-class um, sprinter, but I know that's never going to happen. For sure. Like genetics. Yeah, I mean, the muscle fiber type is going to be the biggest factor in that, what your kind of genetic potential is to excel at one or the other of those two types of events. Um, and for most people, in most of the muscle groups, when they looked at biopsies that have done on lots of different people, most people are kind of 50 50, kind of half fast twitch, half slow twitch. And those people are, like most of us, never going to be great. Endurance athletes, never going to be great sprinters. You know, the more you tend to have a higher percentage of fast twitch fibers, the better your potential to be a great sprinter is. The more you have a high percentage of slow twitch fibers, the better potential is it to be a great endurance athlete. You know, Usain Bolt can never be a great marathon runner. He doesn't have the right genetic makeup, just like the world record holder for the marathon will never be a great sprinter. They just don't, they don't match up. Um, so that's the biggest factor. You know, we can train hard and we can train to try to overcome our genetic abilities, <clears throat> but you'll have more success in athletics usually if you gravitate towards the things that you were built for from a muscle fiber standpoint. And, and that's often what happens. People have success in a given event because they have one fiber type that's dominant. And so they like doing those events because they get a good feeling by being successful at it. Um, and then sometimes you have people that kind of fight what they're built to do because they just like the activity better or they like that sport better. Um, and they can maximize their abilities, but they may never be the best because they just don't have the genetic makeup to be the best. Um, all right, so we've got some definitions on this page. Um, we've got fitness. Um, and ability to perform physical work is kind of the broad definition of fitness. And then um, I re-added this on the second part, this elements of physical fitness. These are the health-related components. I bolded that this morning. So cardiorespiratory fitness or function, muscle strength, muscle endurance, flexibility, body composition. Um, and then some people will talk about skill-related as a way to look at fitness. Who remembers some of the skill-related physical fitness components. We talked about them in PATH probably. Is agility one of them? Okay, so agility, yeah. Coordination. Coordination, yeah. Balance. Balance, kind of reaction time. So a lot of the things that we think of that you need for our popular ball and field court sports things like that, to be a great tennis player, basketball player, soccer player, baseball player. You need a lot of these skill-related components. I'm not saying that it doesn't help to have great strength 
for those sports, but many of those, you know, game type sports are the people that are most successful have a high level of skill related fitness. Um, there is definitely overlap between a lot of these things, um, for sure. You know, if you're, if you're carrying an extra 150 pounds of body fat, it's pretty hard to be agile and quick and those kind of things. So there is, you know, it kind of makes sense in some of these areas. And it's, if you don't have good strength, it's hard to be quick too, because you can't react and explode and shift direction and move your body mass very well either. So there's definitely, you know, some carryover between all those different components, but the health related ones are what we should mostly in most physical therapy settings be the most worried about because those are about living long and healthy lives. They're not about, you know, being a great soccer player. Now, the exception would be, are you working with a population and that's their thing? Are you working with a college sports team? Are you working in an outpatient clinic that mostly sees an athletic population? Then the way that you're treating your patients will have some differences compared to just the average person that hurt their back, that had their knee replaced, that had rotator cuff surgery, or whatever we might be dealing with. Um, and then we've got our endurance components there, ability to work for a long period of time, um, and resist fatigue. And again, we can have either muscular endurance or cardiovascular endurance. Um, so what's pictured down here, we've got these soldiers holding up that log, looks like a telephone pole. Um, I don't know how many people are on that chain, but I'm guessing they're probably just making them hold it as long as possible. And it's a teamwork thing that you can't give out or it's gonna put more load on your buddy standing next to you. Um, and then we've got these guys doing their, um, you know, leg raises kind of laying on their back. Looks like the one guy's getting waterboarded or something. I'm not really sure what's going on there. Um, these are probably like Navy SEALs or something like that going through this. So is this more cardiovascular endurance or muscular endurance? The first one seems like muscular endurance. I think they probably both are. It, it's yeah, hard to definitely, say. definitely anaerobic effort. Yeah, for sure this one would be in a row because you're just holding that posture forever. You're not moving at all. This one, at least they're moving their legs up and down, it would appear. Um, but I think it's probably still more geared towards muscular endurance than, than cardiovascular. All right, so we talked about VO2. Um, saw the video, video uh, of that person doing the test. Um, and, and this is the type of setup that I use. I didn't use the kind that the um, people in that first video had. Um, you've got this big tube coming off and this has basically two valves in it and they're both one-way valves. So the air that the person's breathing comes in this side, goes to their lungs, goes out, and then that it can't escape this way. So it goes down this collecting tube and then you pull samples off of that to look at the changes in oxygen concentration between the air in the room and the air that the person's blowing out. And we can measure that and combine it with the volume of air that they're breathing, and then we can figure out how much oxygen are they actually using during that activity. Um, and so that's kind of the setup that we see right there for this person on the bike. They've got their nose pinched off, which you have to do, because if you're letting the person also breathe out through their nose, then you're getting incomplete data. It is kind of uncomfortable. Um, your throat will kind of tend to dry out a lot. It's not fun to do for a long period of time. And you got to have that mouthpiece in. You can't really swallow super well. Um, and then down below there, you got a nice little spit trap. So those that played like a horned instrument in band or orchestra or something are probably familiar with spit traps. Sometimes they just have valves. They don't actually have traps. So they're just like dripping everywhere. Um, in any event, that's our setup for that. So we usually will grade this relative to the person's body weight. Um, milliliters per kilogram per minute is the most common way that we try to level the field. Um, on a bike, sometimes they'll do it a little bit differently. They'll just talk about liters per minute um, and they won't scale it to body size as much, um, which it is easier to get a higher VO2 total volume of oxygen that you're breathing the bigger you are. You have more muscle mass that's using oxygen. So somebody that's 200 pounds, it's way easier for them to have a higher overall volume of oxygen used than somebody that weighs 100 pounds. Um, and that's where if we scale it per kilogram of body weight, we try to even it out a little bit to make it more of an apples to apples kind of comparison. And that's what we'll typically see with most treadmill type tests. Um, now our lactate threshold, um, 
is a little bit different. It is a percentage of your VO2 max. And so if you look down at these values down at the bottom for well-trained athletes, their lactate threshold is about 70 to 80% of their VO2. For somebody that's really well-trained, might even be higher than that. Whereas the average person, it's going to be more like at about 50% of their VO2. And so this lactate threshold is essentially the point where the way we're producing ATP switches from being largely aerobic to being largely anaerobic. And once we start having to produce ATP anaerobically, we can still keep going for a while, but we're causing really rapid changes in our blood pH that are going to ultimately cause fatigue at the muscular level and make you have to stop. Um, and so we can definitely change that lactate threshold by doing things like interval training. We will move that lactate threshold from say 60% to 80%. Um, we'll probably also improve the person's VO2 overall, their max with interval training, but we can also make that person capable of holding that higher pace for a longer period of time. The higher your lactate threshold is, that means a higher percentage of your VO2 max you're capable of sustaining for that long period of time. Um, so it makes a big difference in performance if we can make this change. Um, so am I correct in uh, thinking that the aerobic system is utilizing the Krebs cycle? Mm -hmm. And so if oxygen is the final receiver of the hydrogen ions, then if there's a backup, like there isn't oxygen there to receive those, and that's what kind of stops the aerobic system and the anaerobic system has to take mm -hmm. over? Has to take over, yeah. I mean, there's always, it's always a gradation. You know, even if we're just walking slow, we're producing some ATP through anaerobic processes. But as we start ramping that intensity up, then we can't keep pace with just oxidative metabolism. We have to start supplementing it with those anaerobic means. So it's not that we turn off the switch um, and transition distinctly. We're no longer doing aerobic. Now we're doing anaerobic. It's a continuum. Um, but proportionally, the higher the intensity goes, the more we're going to have to rely on those anaerobic means to generate ATP. So there's a whiteboard function on Zoom where I can draw, but I haven't figured it out yet. I didn't play around with it. So I drew a graph. So we're gonna look at our VO2 graph for starters. Um, so VO2 is a very much a linear relationship. So I've got over here, I've got VO2 and heart rate and heart rate will track right in line with VO2 typically. And on the bottom it's workload. So as the workload gets higher, both the heart rate and the VO2 consumed will raise in linear fashion until we get up near the top and then it's gonna plateau. When we see that plateau happen, when we're not, we're working harder, but we're not using any more oxygen, then we know that we've reached that person's VO2 max. Now, if we look at lactate threshold, the curve's a little bit differently. Um, and down here on the side, I've got lactate threshold, but I've also got the ventilatory ratio between O2 and CO2. And so those things, the ventilatory threshold and the lactate threshold are kind of the same function. They're not exactly the same thing, but they're gonna occur usually at about the same period of time. And so what that ventilatory threshold is saying is, if you're able to match the oxygen consumed with the CO2 produced, you're gonna see this linear line right here. Just like if we're producing lactate, but we're getting rid of the lactate, we're not gonna see blood lactate levels rise. At some point as that workload increases, we're going to get to the point where we're going to see this really steep rise. And that basically coincides with where we no longer can process the lactate that the muscles are producing. So we start seeing it show up in the bloodstream. It starts to climb. And that is basically linked to when we start overbreathing. We're producing a lot of CO2. We have to breathe more to get rid of it more. And we tend to actually overbreathe relative to how much oxygen we're actually using. So the ventilatory threshold and the lactate threshold are usually occur at about the same place. And they're both functions of us no longer being able to keep pace with the waste we're producing. And, and we're no longer able to process the oxygen that we're bringing in at a rate where we can stop the lactate from increasing. So we see kind of different graphs with those two things. Um, and again, if somebody was 
that average person, if we looked at what half that person's VO2 is, say about there, we drop straight down, that would be the average person's kind of lactate threshold. The way I've drawn this, this person's like lactate threshold is right at max, which wouldn't happen. My, my curve should be on this bottom one, should be a little bit more to that side if it was going to be more accurate. So those are kind of the ways that you'll look at those two um, values. And they're definitely both changeable to a point. Um, you can only increase VO2 max so much. Um, you can kind of keep, if you keep training really well, you can kind of keep pushing that lactate threshold closer and closer towards your VO2 max, but your ability to increase your VO2 max definitely has an upper limit. It won't just keep going up and up and up and up um, by continued training. All right, um, it's about nine o'clock. Let's take a little break here. Um, it's 9.02 on my watch. Let's take till about 9.10 um, and then we'll pick back up and go through the rest of these slides a little bit quicker. Hey, Craig, what was on the left side of the first graph drawing? I, I had VO2 and heart rate. VO2 and heart rate. Yeah. Okay. So those will tend to both increase in linear fashion until you get close to your max and then it will we'll plateau. So those two graphs were kind of meant to go together and showing what happens at each level? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And the tests are done a little bit differently. Um, you know, the, the VO2 max test, you're gonna see like they did on the treadmill test that we watched in the video. I don't know if you remember, they talked about at each, every three minutes, we're gonna make it faster and we're gonna make it steeper. Mm -hmm. When you're doing a lactate threshold test, usually if we're running anyways, you're gonna keep it level because you're trying to say, what speed is your lactate threshold? When, do, what pace is it that you start ramping it up? And if we add in the hill, then it makes it harder to factor that out. And so we'll tend to, the lactate threshold test is usually longer in duration because we're making very small bumps, like 10 meters a minute. We go from 100 meters a minute to 110 meters a minute and see what happens. It's two minutes later, we go to 120 meters a minute. So we're trying to just give these little bitty bumps so that when we do see that inflection point, when that graph shoots up, we can kind of say, okay, this is at, seven miles an hour, that's your lactate threshold, and that's whatever eight and a half minute mile pace. Um, okay. Okay, thanks. Yep. Uh, hey, Kirk. Yep. Um, I sent the test to Johnny and he didn't respond. Uh, am I good to come today? Um, I, th I think so. Um, I'm, I'm not, a, Johnny's been the one that's coordinating with our campus director, so he knows the ins and outs of that policy better than us, but you were never, nobody ever tested positive that you're around, or? No, yeah. You just had other symptoms, mm -hmm. and now you don't have symptoms. I just have a dry cough that I can't get rid of, but everything else is good. Um, yeah, then I think you're probably fine, as long as you can answer the course key without making it come up red. Um, then I think you're probably fine to be there. Okay, okay sounds good. Thanks. Yeah.
I did one of those years ago. I was thinking, I'm trying to think where I actually have the paperwork. I was going to try to dig it out, uh -huh. see what my numbers were. It's been probably been 20 years, but yeah, yeah. I remember it was a bike or a on a bike. It was yeah. one of the sponsors of the team I raced on that they were a performance clinic. Yeah. And so that was part of our sponsorship was they did a major workup evaluation. Uh -huh. Did they do lactates too, or just be yeah? They were actually pricking our finger during the yeah during the actual bike part. And there was a there was another guy on the team. So I was probably ten years older than most of the guys racing in my group, and another guy on the team that was the only other guy about my size. And you're talking about um, you know finding a sport that fits your body composition. I couldn't have picked a. <laughs> I'm way too big to be a cyclist, but. Um, he was another one that was about my size. So I was constantly watching his numbers to see yeah, how yeah. we stacked up. And it was, it was a, it was an interesting experience for sure. Yeah. Yeah. We used to, when I worked in LA before I was a PT, I did a lot of these tests and we would, we had a trainer kind of thing, you know, where you could bring in your own bike, um, and put it on that instead of just going on a standard stationary bike ergometer, which is helpful because then you, you know, it's more specific to what the person's been training on. So their numbers should be more meaningful because that's the bike they're going to race on or compete on. Um, the geometry and the gearing and all that kind of stuff matches what they're already used to compared to just our, you know, our big bulky couch type bike seat and <laughs> everything else. That the, and, you know, your the adjustability on a lot of stationary bikes for testing is not great as far as the front to back position of the saddle and the handlebar positions and all those kind of things. That's how theirs was. I'm trying to think though, because they were measuring watts too. And I can't yeah. remember what component they were using to measure the watts, but it was just, it was exactly that. It was their trainer. Mm -hmm. that, and then we all brought our own bikes. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's mathematical formulas that you can do to calculate watts based on the gearing ratio and the, and the pedal revolutions and things like that. Um, so that's probably how they did it, or the trainer might have sensed it too. There might have been some mechanism for the actual thing to sense the friction and the revolution or something that they're having to push. All right, let's get rolling again. Um, so we've got aerobic exercise training as our kind of our header, and then we've got deconditioning as kind of the little subhead down there. And so when we do specific aerobic exercise training, we're just trying to, in a systematic and regular way, engage in some form of aerobic activity so that we improve our ability to handle that type of activity. Um, and just like any form of exercise, we can manipulate those five drum variables to try and change the effect. Um, whether we're gonna make things harder, longer, more often, um, those are going to be kind of the variables that we usually change. And again, the intensity can be your speed. It could be the amount of incline that you're going up. Um, it could be, you know, things of that nature would be the most common things that we'd look at for intensity. Um, certainly, we can measure that from a physiological standpoint just by looking at heart rate. And so the heart doesn't really care if you're going uphill or you're going fast. It's just trying to pump the amount of blood that you need. Um, and so that's a good way to just really gauge intensity um, because it is so linearly related to workload when we look at aerobic activity. Um, hey, Craig. Uh -huh. So when I try to turn my video back on, it says that it can't because the host has stopped it. I didn't stop it. <laughs> I don't think. <laughs> Oh, now I just said, oh, there we go. Start my video. Okay, thanks. I said to ask to start video. I don't think I shut yours off, but maybe I did on accident. I'm grounded. I'm, yeah, apparently. Put you in timeout. I shut, forgot to shut off the mic, though. Dang it. No. No, I'm kidding. I didn't really mean that. All right. Um, so we do need to use big muscle groups um, if we really want to make that aerobic activity aerobic. Um, and you know, swimming is, does use more muscles, different muscles than say running or cycling does, but you'll have a really hard time getting as high of VO2 values swimming because the big driver in swimming is more your arms than your legs and your arms have way less muscle mass than your legs. 
Um, so even though you are using your legs to kick, most of the work that you're doing in most of the swimming strokes is coming from your arms. If we look at like freestyle and backstroke, I want to say it's more like 80% arms and like 20% legs. Um, and we're just not very efficient in moving water when we kick. So you can kick hard and use a lot of energy, but it doesn't really propel you very well um, compared to how well our arms can do. So it is a little bit harder to get high VO2 values with swimming. Plus the test is really hard. They can use metabolic carts and like walk along the edge of the pool and follow the person with the tubing attached. Um, the more common way that they'll do those tests is in a swimming flume where they actually have the person, it's like a swimming treadmill where the water moves past the person and you can change the speed of the water flow so the person's just swimming in place um, as you do that. But it is harder logistically than not being in the water to do those kind of tests. So deconditioning um, is going to happen really quickly. And again, those the blood volume changes are what will change the fastest. If all of a sudden we take this fit person and they're in a car wreck or something and they get stuck in bed because they have multiple fractures or whatever and they can't no longer do their activity that they used to do to stay fit, they're going to pretty rapidly lose some aerobic conditioning. Most immediately that blood flow, they're going to pee out all the extra plasma volume that you really don't need anymore. Um, the changes of capillarization and mitochondrial density and, and um, potential hypertrophy in the heart, things like that will change. But those are structural things that we kind of have to get rid of. They're not like immediate things that our kidney can just pee out extra fluid and be done with. So those adaptations do decrease not as rapidly as some of them some of the other things like blood flow, but we will see a pretty rapid decline. Now, this uh, guy on the couch there, he's doing some balancing exercises. Did you know that? He's balancing that remote on his belly and he's having to be a chest breather because he's breathing with his diaphragm, his balance of that remote would be a lot harder. Um, we won't do that balance activity when we get to balance in this class. We will do some balance activities, that is not one of them. But that is kind of hard because it's a big round area. It's kind of hard to balance on that. All right. Um, so here's our three different energy systems that we talk about in the body. Our phosphagen, also known as our creatine phosphate system or phosphocreatine system. That is our immediate fastest way to reform ATP. It does not involve glucose. It does not involve fats. We have creatine phosphate. We can chop off the phosphate from the creatine phosphate, donate it to the ADP, reform ATP. We have a very limited amount of that in our body. And so if you're doing a true sprint, that's going to be the dominant way that we produce ATP. Um, if I'm running a 100 meter dash, if I'm running, you know, I've I stole the basketball and I'm sprinting down court to throw in the layup, or in my case, the dunk before the opponent gets back on D, then I'm going to be sprinting. I'm using largely this creatine phosphate system. Um, again, all three of these systems are active, whether we're sprinting or walking really slow, proportionally, which one, what percentage of energy is being generated from each of these forms is what changes. Um, kind of the one in the middle, the anaerobic glycolytic system, that is using just glycogen or stored muscle glucose um, we can, you know, break that down pretty quickly. It's inefficient in that we end up having to use up two ATP to kind of jumpstart that anaerobic glycolysis process. We generate four ATP out of it. So for each glucose, we're essentially only making two ATP. So it's not super efficient. When we look at being able to use the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain, for any given molecule of glucose, then we're looking at more like 30, 35 ish ATP generated per glucose. So, way more efficient way to get a lot of more bang for our buck when it comes to our food sources. Um, and again, so anytime we go beyond about two minutes of exercise, the ability to generate ATP aerobically is what's going to kick in and be the dominant way that we're doing that. And the more you go out from two minutes, the more so that's going to be. If I'm doing a mile event, 
that's going to take, you know, say an elite mile runner for men, it's looking at like 345, probably 350 um, for women, probably more like 420 or something like that. Um, that's twice as long. That's still a pretty heavy anaerobic contribution um, compared to somebody running a marathon or somebody doing an Ironman that they're out there for 10 hours, 12 hours. Um, those are much more aerobically dominant events. The, the longer it takes, the more you have to go aerobic because you just cannot, you'll burn through your glycogen so fast if you're going high intensity for a long period of time and you'll run out of gas. All right, so where all these numbers kind of come from. Um, so we've got our kilocalories. And again, that's a unit of heat. Um, when we look at how many calories a given type of exercise burns, it is based on how much oxygen you're consuming. So we consume roughly five kilocalories for every liter of oxygen that we consume. Um, and so they've done calculations. So you can figure out if I'm cycling at this speed, if I'm swimming at this speed, if I'm running it or walking at a given speed, how many calories should I burn um, for that time period. And, and walking and running, um, the easiest kind of ballpark estimate that you can give patients or people that care about this, um, besides what you should know for a test, um, is about 100 calories per minute or per mile is kind of a ballpark. It is going to depend on body size and efficiency a little bit. Um, but for most people, you know, if you're somebody really, really petite and small, um, you might burn 80 calories a minute. 80 calories a mile, whether you're walking or running, it's going to take you longer to, to go that mile if you're walking versus running, but roughly about 100 calories is kind of ballpark. Somebody that's really, really big, they might burn 120 calories per mile, um, but for most people, it's give or take about 100 calories per mile. If you're walking, maybe that's 20 minutes to cover that mile. If you're running, maybe that's 10 minutes to cover that mile, still roughly about 100 calories. Um, so that's kind of um, how to think about calorie burning physical activity. Um, this MET, the metabolic equivalent, is basically 3.5 milliliters per kilogram per minute. So that's our VO2 max kind of um, units that we use, and that's where it's derived from. But they say that one MET is essentially a resting metabolic expenditure. So at rest, on average, we're going to burn about three and a half milliliters of oxygen every minute per kilogram of our body weight. So that bigger person will burn a higher total volume of oxygen, but proportionally it should be about the same. And so we can use those met units to judge intensity. Um, and sometimes you'll see that, especially with cardiologists tend to use that more than anybody else. Um, where say after a heart attack, they'll be like, well, we don't want the person doing anything that's more than a format activity. Or as they're starting to get back in shape, they're okay to exercise, but I don't want them going above seven met activity. Um, and so, and, and we've they've developed tables that um, talk about different activities and how many mets they are. How many mets is it to walk a given speed? How many mets is it to mow your yard with a push mower? How many mets is it to vacuum? Um, so they've got all kinds of, you know, exercise activities, but also ADL activities that they've quantified how many METs those things are. So that's where METs become relevant, but they really are just a percentage of that VO2. Um, and the, the higher somebody's aerobic capacity, the higher their VO2 max, the more METs they're capable of exercising at or performing at. Um, and so here you see some different activities listed how many calories per minute they would burn, and then also how many METs um, those activities match up with. All right, so what goes on in the body when we exercise? So if we start doing aerobic activity, um, I go out for a run, I go out for a bike ride, I go for a swim, um, we're gonna see the heart rate increase um, we will have um, the vagus nerve essentially is going to create a situation where the SA node is more likely to fire more quickly. Um, so the vagus nerve kind of indirectly influences that SA node and how 
easy it is for it to depolarize, fire, reset, depolarize, fire, reset. Um, so it speeds that process up. We will have a more forceful contraction of the heart too. Um, we'll often see increases in sympathetic nervous system response. And those things also act on the receptors on the heart muscle to make the heart muscle engage more of the heart muscle itself to fire um, and, and just basically try to fire more forcefully so that we can increase the ejection fraction. So that for the blood that did return to the heart after that last beat, now we're able to squeeze out more blood. So instead of only pumping out, say, half the blood with each beat that was in the heart, we can pump out 70% of the blood that was in the heart with each beat. And so if we combine the increased rate with the increased myocardial contractility, that myocontractility will mostly change that stroke volume. Because if we can squeeze more blood out of the heart with each beat, that's going to give us a bigger stroke volume. And heart rate times stroke volume is what is the equation that for cardiac output. So if we can increase these two, we will increase the third one too. If we increase either of those top two, we'll increase the cardiac output. So if we're trying to maximally increase cardiac output, then we want to speed up the heart and we want to make it beat harder so it can pump more efficiently. Um, we will see a big rise in systolic blood pressure because we're pumping out more blood. We're, our stroke volume is faster. We're pumping out at a much faster rate. Um, and so that systolic blood pressure will increase pretty rapidly. Um, it will tend to increase kind of like heart rate pretty much in a linear fashion. The more intense the workload is, the more that systolic blood pressure is going to keep climbing. And then at max, it will tend to kind of plateau and flatten out. So it has a fairly similar um, track to what we see with heart rate. Now, because we're exercising so hard, we're going to have a lot of vasodilation going to the muscles that are doing all that work. We're trying to deliver a lot of blood so that we can reduce the waste that's being produced and get some more oxygen down to those tissues. And so we have a lot more space in the body for the blood to go. And so that total peripheral resistance drops. Um, and that's what makes the diastolic blood pressure not really change a whole lot um, when we look at blood pressure response to exercise. In many cases, your diastolic blood pressure, when somebody is working hard with aerobic activity, you'll see it go down. Um, rather than go up. The systolic will, should always climb. The diastolic generally should stay about the same or might even drop a little bit, um, depending on how long the person's going for. So those blood pressure responses are very different between the pressure when the heart is pumping the blood out actively versus the pressure in between beats. And that diastolic pressure tends to stay the same or drop because of all the peripheral vasodilation that we've got going on. So there's less resistance to blood flow in the periphery. Um, when we look at our breathing response, we're going to breathe faster. We're going to breathe deeper. So that's kind of similar to our heart rate going up. And then breathing deeper is kind of similar to our stroke volume getting better. We're, we're moving a larger volume of air with each, with each breath if we breathe more deeply but we're also moving a larger volume of air if we breathe more rapidly. So improving both of those will improve our, um, the amount of airflow that we're getting down to the alveoli. And that's really the key thing because if we don't have gas exchange at the alveolar level, then we're not gonna get gas exchange at the blood level because we need fresh air getting down into those alveoli so that the higher concentration of oxygen in that newly introduced air is able to diffuse out of the alveoli and get into the bloodstream. And same thing with reducing waste. The blood that's returning to the lung um, from the body wants to get rid of the CO2 that's too high there. And if we're not getting good gas exchange in the alveoli, there's a lesser diffusion gradient that causes the CO2 to want to leave the bloodstream and, and help with homeostasis. So tidal volume and respiratory rate will increase. Um, that will increase our overall amount of ventilation, and that should also increase the amount of alveolar ventilation. Now, the ability of the lungs to work well is highly dependent on the ability of the heart to work well. I can breathe all I want, but if I can't pump a large volume of blood to those lungs, I'm not going to make gas exchanges going to happen nearly as well. 
So we kind of need both an improved heart response and an improved respiratory response to really be able to get in better shape with that aerobic activity and be able to perform that activity well. All right, over so those are both, uh, those information on that last slide were the acute effects of aerobic activity. When we start doing that activity, what happens in the body? Now, over time, when we do that regular aerobic exercise at three times a week for 30 minutes or however long you're going, um, we will see these changes occur chronically. So decreased resting heart rate and blood pressure um, we will increase our blood volume and our hemoglobin levels. And again, if we increase our blood volume, then to pump the same amount of blood per minute at rest, we don't have to beat as hard because we have a lot more volume to begin with. And it's easier for us to have a big stroke volume. So we can, those two things kind of are interrelated to one another. And then the increased hemoglobin is because we're increasing our red blood cell count so that we do have a better ability to deliver oxygen to the tissues that need it. Um, and that's again, not gonna happen immediately. That's gonna take some time for us to ramp up red blood cell production. Now there's some things in your book that are a little um, contradictory with most exercise physiology texts. And this next point is one of them. That's why I put that asterisk there to remind me. Um, so your book says that we will see a decreased VO2 at rest. Well, you really won't. Your, your body needs a given amount of oxygen for its resting metabolic needs, and that's not going to change whether you're in better shape or not. So your VO2 shouldn't change at rest unless your body size changed. If I got a lot bigger, then I would need more oxygen at rest. If I lost a lot of weight, then I would need less oxygen at rest. If I lost 50 pounds, I have less 50 pounds less weight to you know, keep metabolically healthy. Um, so that really doesn't change with training. Um, now this decreased VO2 at submax also really won't change unless you change how you're doing the motion. There is a calculated oxygen cost that you can figure out for any given workload on the bike, however many watts you're pushing, for any given treadmill speed that you're going. Um, that we can do a mathematical equation and say, this is the how much oxygen it takes to move at that pace. Um, and that really won't change, like I say, unless you got way more efficient. So if we look at some of our patients, um, if we have a patient that has a, had a stroke and one side of their body is, has a lot of paresis and weakness, isn't, isn't very efficient at moving, it's gonna take more oxygen for them to move that body. Over time, if they improve and their coordination and their muscle recruitment gets better and it's more similar to the uninvolved side over time, then yes, their oxygen cost would go down because they're walking more efficiently because their movement pattern has gotten better. But if we haven't changed that and I'm still just as capable of walking a given speed as I was prior to, the oxygen cost doesn't really change with training. Um, we will see over time improvements in VO2 max up to a point. Um, and the more sedentary the person is to start, the more room they have for improvement. If you take somebody that's already been training for years and you try to have them do more intense training, yeah, they might improve their VO2 a little, but they're already pretty close to their maximum capability. So you're less likely to see big changes in max VO2 in somebody that's well-conditioned already. Um, we talked about some of these muscle changes already um, at the start, so I'm not going to spend much time. I think we covered all of those um, when we talked about just general changes that we see with aerobic training. All right, now with the lungs, as long as the person has healthy lungs, respiratory ability is almost never a limiting factor in your aerobic capacity. It's much more about what the heart can do. Can the heart deliver large amounts of blood to the lungs to facilitate the lungs ability to get rid of waste through respiration and bring in more oxygen? But our lungs are oversized compared to our needs, essentially. And we don't see hypertrophy with the lungs. Our lungs do not get bigger with training, unlike our heart muscle, unlike our skeletal muscle. 
unlike our blood volumes. Those things can all change pretty dramatically. Can you breathe more efficiently and make better use of the lungs that you have? That will change. So we will learn how to breathe more effectively and more deeply, get better gas exchange. We can improve the efficiency of breathing, but we don't really change the size of our lungs. It's based on how big is your rib cage, how far can you pull your diaphragm down, how mobile is your rib cage, how much can you cause those ribs to flare up to improve that capacity of the lungs. But those type of changes for most people aren't going to amount to much of anything. Now, if you have unhealthy lungs, you already have COPD, you had a lobectomy because you had cancer, you have really bad asthma. Um, in those patients, yes, gas exchange at the lung could be the limiting factor. But if you don't have a predisposed condition to have lung problems, breathing shouldn't be holding you back. Now, do people feel short of breath when they exercise at a high intensity? Definitely. Do they, do they feel short of breath? Sure. A lot of people do. Certainly if you do, if you're truly doing aerobic activity, you shouldn't. Because if, if the activity is aerobic, your, mat, your body's ability to produce waste and bring in fresh oxygen should be evenly matched. And that's that flat line that I showed on the lactate threshold graph. For every bit of CO2 that we're producing, we're able to get rid of it, prevent the blood pH changes, we're bringing in the amount of oxygen that we need, it's closely matched. So we shouldn't see that. Now, well, you, you said high intensity, that led me to think you were, when I hear high intensity, I think over aerobic threshold. It is, yes. And so when we are exercising at high intensity, people will get short of breath. If you do lots of wind sprints, I mean, they, when I did them in football, we called them gassers because everybody'd be putting their hands on their knees, gasping for breath. It's, we breathe harder with anaerobic activity than we do with aerobic activity. And, and I've had students in the past that thought, well, it's aerobic. That means I'm using lots of oxygen. So that means I need to breathe more. We will breathe more for anaerobic activity because we're producing a lot more metabolic waste that we're trying to get rid of. That increased respiratory response is about reestablishing homeostasis and getting rid of the waste much more so than it is delivering the oxygen. So um, yes, you will. if you're feeling short of breath when you're exercising, you need to slow down if your goal is to go for, to make it aerobic. If your goal is to improve your you know, lactate threshold, then by all means, do some intervals, get yourself short of breath. Those type of things would help improve your lactate threshold. But if your goal is to go from being able to do 20 minutes of running to be able to do 30 minutes of running, if you're breathing really hard, you're going anaerobic and you're not gonna be able to sustain that pace. Um, you should not really feel that short of breath if you're truly working at an aerobic level because you're matching your waste production with your breathing, um, your respiratory ventilation rates. All right, so um, like I said, we, we will see an improvement in our maximal ventilatory capacity with training but that's less about what's going on in the lungs and more about what the diaphragm can sustain, what the intercostal muscles can sustain, things like that. If we have somebody that a patient that say has really bad spinal arthritis and they have a lot of arthritis where the ribs attach to the vertebrae, if we can improve motion at those joints, you could potentially improve their ventilatory capacity. Um, but the biggest way that we can change this is by helping people understand how to breathe more efficiently, how to use their diaphragm better to move that larger volume of air. Our, our intercostals can't really change our lung capacity that much by pulling up on the ribs. But our diaphragm, if we teach that patient how to use it effectively, can definitely move a much larger volume of air with each breath. So that's what we want to try and work on. And, and we do Again, for a lot of our patients, this may be something that we need to do. You have that really obese patient that has just tons of body fat in their belly. It's really hard for the diaphragm to pull down against that. And so we wanna teach them how to do it to the best of their ability and hopefully encourage them to lose some of that body fat so they have more space in their abdominal cavity now for the diaphragm to move into. If we have people that are very much chest breathers and not belly breathers, then we need to kind of try to 
help them understand how to do that a little bit better too. Um, my wife's been seeing some patients um, recovering from COVID. RMU has a, a free clinic that they run. And um, she had this one gentleman that had COVID like last fall or something like that. And he still gets really short of breath doing every kind of ADL around. And he's just a big time chest breather and he's really not getting good ventilation to his lower lobes in his lungs. And so my wife had him lay on his back and basically put like a weight plate on his belly, put like a 10 pound weight on his belly to try and give him some biofeedback cues of, I want you to make that weight move up and down when you're breathing and not your chest move up and down when you're breathing to kind of cue him and help him to understand how to engage that diaphragm to actually cause that weight to rise and fall with each breath instead of just the chest rising and falling. And so that's kind of an example of how we could potentially train people to use their diaphragm more effectively and be able to tolerate higher levels of aerobic activity. So I've noticed that a lot of um, obese people, my dad included, the breath in is, is relatively quiet, but with the exhalation, there's like a wheeze, especially towards the end. And I wonder if that's kind of like the fat, the fat pushing back against the diaphragm where it's, because it happens only when he, my dad's fl weight flux, fluctuates by like 50 to 100 pounds. Uh -huh. And so I really notice that when he's bigger, I can hear him breathing. I'm like, dad, you're wheezing. And he's like, no, I'm not. And it's at the end of the exhalation. So I always wondered what the physiological. Could be that it's just all of a sudden causing this like extra pushback and increasing flow rate and just causing a little bit more turbulence in the airways. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It's possible. I, I don't know for sure, but it, it might be. Sounds feasible. All right. So here's our um, things that we need to know as far as contraindicated values that we should see. If we're working with a patient and we see these numbers, then we want to think about stopping activity. Um, so if the person is exercising and you get their heart rate higher than what you would predict their max heart rate, we don't really want to be pushing people to max in therapy. Um, that's a recipe for something bad to happen, like a heart attack. <laughs> so we want to stay well below their predicted max. And we, we had the calculation on the last test about target heart rate range. The target is never 100% of max. It's always 50%, 60%, 70%, 80% of max. Um, and especially in a therapy setting. If you're talking about elite athletic performance and you're trying to really improve their ability to push hard, then yeah, you might push them to max. But for a patient population, we're not going there. Um, they're, they're, they're patients for a reason. Uh, they're not entirely well. Um, and so we don't want to push them to that point. Systolic blood pressure, if we see that going up above 260, that's pretty high, right? We take it at rest. We talk about resting values. Oh, anything over 120 is considered elevated to some degree. And it is at rest. But if we're working hard, it is normal for that systolic blood pressure to climb pretty significantly. Um, now, I will tell you, it is hard to accurately hear blood pressures when people are exercising. We're going to practice that a little bit in lab today. We'll do it a lot more next semester. Most of you are, or a lot of you are still getting comfortable taking blood pressure at rest in a nice, quiet space. Um, exercise equipment makes a lot of noise, especially a treadmill. You got a motor running, you got feet pounding the belt, you got the patient breathing hard. Um, you might have other people in the room making noise. You have to learn how to screen out the background noise with your ears and those stethoscope and recognize when that heart is beating, when you're hearing that pulse. It's, you're not going to be as accurate as you can be at rest. And that's okay. You're still just trying to be able to recognize when do I first hear that noise? What is that systolic pressure? Because you need to know if maybe you don't hear it at you know, if that person is actually like say 260 and you haven't developed the ability to hear really well that and screen out the, the regular rhythm of the heart rate compared to the regular pounding of that person's foot on the treadmill belt, um, you might let them keep going when you shouldn't. Um, if all you can hear is, oh, I didn't hear it until it was really loud at 200. You need to be able to recognize when you first start barely hearing it 
and identify that sound versus all the other background stuff that you're hearing. And that's kind of the key. Um, so you've got a predicted max heart rate. But when we go into an exercise session, are we, are we gonna have a parameter for blood pressure as well? Um, you might, depending on what the, you know, if the person's taking blood pressure medicine, then I wouldn't expect to see this value. Um, but as long as they're not having other symptoms, they're doing okay, and there's not a reason from a, like a, we don't want their heart rate to go above a certain point, then you could keep allowing them to go hard. Um, again, it would depend on specific contraindications, but for somebody that doesn't have any other necessary reasons why we need to not let them push hard, we can let them go up to roughly about 250 or so and not be that worried that something negative is gonna happen. Um, when I went into PT in June, I did have specific heart rate and blood pressure max values that the physician provided the yeah. PT with that I couldn't pass. Yeah, and if you, you know, if you got somebody coming off of a stroke, coming off of a heart attack, you are gonna have those limitations in place. Heart rate, you know, for heart attack patient, they might say, well, we don't want you to go more than 30 beats above the resting. And so if the resting is 90, then all we're doing is going up to 120. And if we get that hard, then we're going to stop and rest, or we're going to back down on the intensity, have them slow down, um, take a breather until their heart rate comes back down. And same thing with, with blood pressure. If we notice, they say, we don't want it to go systolic to go above 180, then that 260 rule goes out the window. Um, but if we, if we look at somebody that doesn't have other reasons, we can go up to about 250 or so before we think about needing to stop or, or slow them down. If we don't see systolic blood pressure rise, despite the fact that we're working more intensely, then that's a bad sign too. That means the heart's not capable of really having that good, powerful stroke volume. And so that could potentially cause some problems too. So we should see it rise. Maybe you only see it go from 120 to 140 or 160, and if the workload that they're doing isn't that great, that would be normal. But if this person's like working towards max and you're only going from 120 to 160, then that's not a normal response. You should see it rise more than that. Um, but for sure, if we really don't see it rise much at all then, and we're having them do significantly more work than they were doing at rest, then we need to be concerned about that. Um, diastolic blood pressure normally should stay the same or go down. If we see it increase more than 10 points, then that's a bad sign too. So if they were, you know, 140 over 90 at rest and we have them start exercising, they go up to 170 over 110, I'm not worried about the 170, I'm worried about the 110. Um, the 170 went up more maybe, but the 110 is the one that's problematic because that's not the normal response that we should see. They're not vasodilating the way they should be. We start having other symptoms shortness of breath, chest pain, dizziness, nausea, start getting pale. Um, those are all reasons to stop as well. Um, and this woman over here in the hospital again, looks like they've got her still on a ventilator. That's why they've got that tape on her mouth. It's taping the ET tube down her throat. So you can walk people on a vent um, if they're capable and not sedated. Obviously not if they're sedated on a vent. That doesn't work very well. All right, we've got our FIT principle. Um, this is just kind of the short version of the five drum. Um, so with, with aerobic exercise, how often are you having them work? What's our intensity? Um, and heart rate's the most common thing that we look at for intensity. Um, we'll talk about some other ways to judge intensity here in just a sec. Um, and then our time and then our type. Um, and again, our, the specificity principle is really important if we look at a competitive athlete, if we want them to get improve their capability in a given sport, that's the thing that they need to be doing. Um, for me to go swimming isn't gonna really help my running that much. Um, it might be fine for creating a stimulus for my heart, for my lungs, but the way I'm using my muscles is very different and I'm not gonna have the same carryover of the training effect. And, and same with vice versa, just doing a lot of running is not gonna do a whole lot for your swimming ability. So what about, I don't want to use the word cross training, but that's what I'm thinking. And like, for example, when I went in last year with knee issues, they gave me a bunch of 
hip flexor and ab and abductor exercises, which had really nothing to do with my knees other than strengthening other muscles to support my knees. So what about that aspect of a more rounded um, aerobic training program? Um, I mean, it, it has merit and I mean, it will, if we're trying to decrease and, and help deal with a musculoskeletal condition, then doing other types of aerobic activity as substitutes will help you maintain the heart and lung function. You won't lose as much blood volume. You'll keep your heart capable of having a good strong stroke volume and things like that. But as far as the metabolic changes in the muscle, the capillarizations and enzyme concentrations and things like that, doing that other activity won't do nearly as much for helping hold on to that level of fitness. Um, so I'm not saying cross training is worthless, but it's, it's for an, an elite athlete who's trying to train to their, even non-elite athlete, somebody that's just trying to get better at their sport, recreational or otherwise, their time is going to be better spent on the activity that they're training for. Um, but sometimes we have to balance that out with, if I do too much of this training, then my IT band starts bugging me or my Achilles starts bugging me or my trochanteric bursitis starts bugging me. And so that's where doing some of those other complementary cardiovascular activities can be helpful. You won't lose as much overall conditioning, um, but it's not necessarily going to help you move forward in improving your sport ability in the sport you're most interested in. All right, so how much do we need? Um, CDC, ACSM, American Heart Association all kind of have the same basic recommendations. We want about 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity activity. If you work out more vigorously, your intensity is higher, then you don't need to go as long. Again, intensity and duration are kind of inversely related. Um, so you can do less time if you go harder than that. And, but moderate activity activity is moderate intensity activity is really just like a brisk walk for most people. Um, so you're talking about doing the 30 minute walk five days a week, and that's generally going to be enough to help provide the training benefits that we know help reduce disease risk. That won't necessarily improve performance for a competitive athlete, but as far as decreasing the chance that you're going to get diabetes and heart disease and things like that, that's what these recommendations are more geared towards. For that competitive athlete, they're going to do, need to do more than this, um, for sure. So those are kind of the, the recommendations on that. Um, we look at overload principle. That's in We can overload frequency, go from three days a week to five days a week. We can overload duration, go from 30 minutes to 45 minutes. We can overload intensity, go from 60% of our max heart rate to 80% of our max heart rate. Those would be kind of different ways that we could change those different things um, using the overload principle. Um, for a lot of our heart patients and pulmonary patients, we're going to use what's called their symptom limited max heart rate. So if somebody gets chest pain, they get angina when they start working too hard, we don't want to push them to the point where they're getting angina. We can do an exercise test and say, okay, when your heart rate gets to 140, that's when you start getting your symptoms. So I only want you to exercise at say 75% of 140. That person's max might be 170. Their total max heart rate might be 170, but we don't want them to be getting those symptoms. So that's one way of looking at it with the cardiac patients. A lot of times they'll use a more um, just um, objective heart rate value rather than having to figure out max. They'll just say, like I did earlier, 30 beats above resting, 20 beats above resting. Um, and that can be how much extra activity they, they get. For our generally healthy population, we're gonna, use, we're gonna try and actually calculate target heart rate. Um, and so the, the most common formula that people are familiar with is this first one, 220 minus age. Um, and then you multiply that value times the percentage that you want them to exercise at, 60% of max, 80% of max, whatever the case might be. Um, this newer formula is believed to be better and a little bit more accurate. Um, it depends on how old you are, where it skews the numbers a little bit. Um, I think for the younger population, it tends to bump up the target heart rate a little bit. For the older population, I think it brings it down just a little bit. 
Um, I, I'm okay with you using either one. Um, now the carbonins formula is a little bit different and I think it's really probably the, the best one to use. It uses what's called the heart rate reserve. And so if you look at the formula over here, our target heart rate, we're gonna get the person's resting heart rate and then we're going to add it the resting heart rate to their max heart rate minus the resting heart rate and then multiply that by our percentage. And then we add this value back to the resting heart rate. So let's say for me, my, let's say my resting heart rate's 50, uh, my max heart rate's 170, then I would have 170 minus 50 over here in this parentheses. So I'd have 120, and then I could multiply that 120 times 60% and get a value. And then I could add that back in to my 50. And so that's a more precise way of looking at it. Basically, the heart rate reserve is what's the difference between your lowest heart rate and your highest heart rate? That's the range that you have. And so if somebody already has a really high resting heart rate and they're older and they have a lower max heart rate, well, their range is a lot smaller than a 20-year-old who's super fit who has a max of 200 and a resting of 50. They got 150 beats in that range. So it's a little bit more precise, um, a little bit better. Um, but it definitely is a little more complicated to calculate. The other thing that's a complicating factor with all of these is that max heart rate is always predicted unless we actually test it. And that prediction formula is for one standard deviation is plus or minus 15 beats a minute. And so one standard deviation means that two thirds of the population should fall within that range. And so if I have a 20 year old and I say their max should be 120, well, their max could be 215, their max could be 185. Two thirds of 20 year olds should be somewhere, their max should be somewhere between 185 and 215. And so if we assume that they're 200, hmm, we might be not making them work that hard if they actually can go 215, or we might be making them work too hard if they can actually only go to 185. So we really have to test max to truly understand what it is for a given person. And that becomes risky in a lot of patient populations. We don't want to push people that hard. So heart rate is, is an easy objective way to look physiologically what's going on in the body, get some good objective numbers. Um, other ways that we rate intensity is the Borg scale. Um, and so here's our Borg scale. Starting to run out of time. I don't think I'm going to finish all these. I talked too much at the start. Um, so six to 20, and a lot of people have a hard time with six to 20. They only understand rating stuff one to 10. Um, this formula is, was developed based on 20 year old college students. And if you just add a zero to all of these numbers, they basically correlate with the heart rate that you would expect to see in that young, healthy population. If I'm not working at all, my heart rate would be 60. That's resting heart rate. If I'm easy walking, my heart rate might be 90. That's a very light amount of work. That's where these numbers come from. When I'm working at max, that's 200. That's my max heart rate. So that's why the six through 20 scale is the way that it is. They did come out with a new Borg scale a number of years ago because too many people had a hard time with this. I don't think it's that hard, but a lot of people, it apparently is. Um, yeah, but you're really smart, so. Well, it doesn't take that being very smart to, to and, and really, you don't need to worry about the numbers. If you just let the person read what these things say, then, and as long as they are accurate in their perceptions of their own effort, it works. But we have wimpy people, and we have stoic people, people that want to just bag out early, and people that want to prove that they're the tough guy or gal. And so that can also kind of skew this subjective data. And that's where the heart rate response is great. The person's working at 180 and they're like, oh yeah, this is really easy. It takes them like seven breaths to say, oh yeah, this is really easy. Um, but because it's not, if you're working at 180. All right, time. Um, we do recommend going for longer periods of time, but there's also a lot of research that shows that a little bit multiple times over the course of the day can also have significant improvements in conditioning, especially for people at lower levels of conditioning. 
So if 20 minutes of walking sounds way too daunting for your patients or for you, break it up. Do two 10-minute sessions. Do four or five-minute sessions. Um, you'll still be getting some benefit. And as you continue to improve, then you'll be able to bump that duration out. Um, before pushing somebody's intensity, I would almost always try to push their duration to these minimum levels first. If you can't go 20 minutes, there's no reason to worry about going from 60% of your max heart rate to 70% of your max heart rate. Work to get up to 20 minutes and then you can think about bumping up your intensity. But that duration should be kind of the thing that we should be looking to improve if people can't meet those kind of minimum benchmarks. All right, it's 10, so I'm gonna stop. We'll kind of talk about a lot of these things in lab this week, so I may or may not come back to finish the rest of this presentation. I'll kind of see what's um, remaining and decide if I need to spend lecture time next week on this. So I'll see, have you guys in lab today. Um, definitely come prepared to exercise, especially in the first lab session. In the second lab session, we're gonna do more of a thinking kind of activity. Um, and then I know some of you guys have practicals today, probably. Is that right? Yeah, the modalities. Okay. Well, let me know if you have other questions. And otherwise, I'll see you either today or tomorrow, this afternoon or tomorrow at lab for procedures. Hey, Craig, I had a quick question for you. Oh, yeah. um, so just about my uh, my makeup practical for Therex. Yep. Uh, are we able to just do that today after Therex classes when everyone else is doing their modalities practical or what, what's going to yeah. work best for you? Do you have modalities today or do you have that Wednesday? I have it on Wednesday, actually. I thought I had it today, but... Yeah, no, that's, yeah. that's fine because um, I won't need to be in there for modalities um, at all. Um, okay. So yeah, I can be available and we can just, I'll just have to get whatever equipment we need out of that lab space before they start. And uh, okay. which I don't think we'd need much, maybe some fair band or something like that. We need something with variable resistance and the mold belt and a couple other things, but yeah. Okay. Yeah, we, can, we can plan on that. Okay. Awesome. Thank you.